I'm going to start it at five million dollars. Five million here with six million, seven million, it's here, seven million, five, eight million, nine million, five, ten million. The auction world has never seen anything like it. Deep, 16 million. A new breed of collector. You now, sir, at 21 million. With deep pockets. 40 million. At 55 million dollars, Nicholas is bigger than. 60 million. And an insatiable appetite. At 60 million dollars. No more. 85 in the back there. Ladies bid. 89. China's nouveau riche are driving up prices 90. in antiquities to record levels. 99. Zhou Tianqiu. My favorite word. Yi This is the real beginning. Woo! Beginning of a totally new era. And China's center stage. But there's a dark side. In an undercover investigation, we find this explosive demand for art it's beautifully done. igniting a wave of forgeries. I wouldn't be able to do I'm Steve Chow. On this episode of 101 East, we're in the backyard workshops and auction houses of China, following the path of fakes and forgeries. It's autumn auction season in Hong Kong and the world's premier art houses have opened their doors. Their main buyers, Chinese collectors who have become a major force in the art world. There's one piece I particularly like, which dates from the Song Dynasty. It's a little guan cup, so you can see the, the glaze. Got a bit of Nicholas Chow of Sotheby's is anticipating his selection of Chinese antique porcelain ware. You can see the body. We'll catch their eye touch the skin, it's very smooth, very soft. And how much is this? The estimate is uh, 8 million in Hong Kong, so 1 million US. It's got some natural imperfections here. But Last year, Chinese buyers spent more than five and a half billion dollars on arts and antiques worldwide. One of the most beautiful Nicholas is an expert on Asian art for some of these. One of the top auction houses in the world. He's closely followed what he describes as the meteoric rise of the Chinese collector. It's absolutely monumental. The market was totally redynamized. You have a sort of new, enthusiastic crowd of collectors entering a market with no perceptions of market price uh, and with, you know, a lot of thirst. They really went for it. It's a portrait of Consul Chunhui, who was the second consort of Emperor Qianlong. The highlight of this season's auction is an imperial painting. She was born in 1713. She was created more than 250 years ago. And in the second consul in the second year of the Qianlong reign. The interest here, I think, what continues to fascinate people first is objects made for the imperial court, objects made for the emperors. They're sort of buying back parts of their history. This is what, 400,000? This is R, 420. It's an attempt to, to rebuild that identity in you know, a long lasting 20th something. century. $500,000. But how much of what they're buying is real? What worries Nicholas is their eagerness to buy and their lack of knowledge is fueling a rampant industry of fakes. Fakes are made on a scale that is unimaginable. How many fakes do you come across in the art world? 99.99% of what you see in the market is fake. That high a percentage? Absolutely. Every day um, I get maybe 20, 30 emails jam-packed with, uh, with images of porcelain landing in my mailbox. And the majority? Yeah, all of it is fake, pretty much. At $2 million. It's shaking the auction market to its core. Before a piece gets offered up, his staff must now spend significant time getting experts worldwide to inspect the items. Does that upset you? Um, no, it doesn't upset me. I mean, you know, we've seen <laughs> after, you know, a thousand, two thousand times, I think you're kind of immune. But sometimes it's greed. I mean, you have to understand that if someone shows you a piece and goes, OK, well, Sotheby sold this one for a hundred. I've got the same and I'm selling you for 20. It's greed to think you're going to get this extraordinary bargain. At another auction house, we meet Mason Wong, a veteran collector and dealer of 40 years. So how is this one, Mason? Well, you know, this is one I do not often see. Mason has a lifetime of experience buying and selling authentic antiques and attributes a photographic memory to being able to spot things. Oh, yeah, there's a way to it, yeah. Yeah. And it has the brown rim. I think I was a little gifted, you know. 
because I have pretty good, good visual memory. This may have repair here, but the colors are good. What inspires him is being able to uncover the rich history of China through the pieces he collects. You know, I just want to show people of today, uh, people of in the future, at the part of our history, how we change formed our civilization. Looks good, but you know, not 100% certain. Yeah. He's agreed to look over some items with us. So what do you think of this one? The shape is just a little bit uh, sloppy, i put it that way. It has much wider shoulder than the foot. So would you recommend? I would not collect that one. You would not collect this one, OK. Yeah. That's Mason's way of saying he doesn't trust a piece. We move on. This is the mark of Qianlong, yeah. But I'm not so sure the period. And why is that? Because this turquoise color is too light. Most auctioneers won't guarantee an item's authenticity. Instead, they offer previews like this one, where buyers are given a chance to inspect what's on offer. Once it's sold, there are no returns. So this one you would leave aside? And I would leave. Not touch it? No. This one is what we call a pig dragon. Back at his office, Mason blames the industry as a whole, saying too often auctioneers and collectors who've been duped keep silent to protect their reputations and the value of the fakes they buy. The stuff happening is just you need to open up everything. Must we will have a transparent uh, society. And uh, then we accept your order, and we accept your law to punish people who cheat. It's not just that fakes take money and trust from unsuspecting buyers. What pains Mason most of all is that they can also distort history. And to show us how, he's taking us into the misty hills of northern China. We are going to Hongshan, the Red Mountain. It is through the artifacts of jade carving discovered here. We confirmed the earliest Chinese civilization, 4,500 BC to 3,000 BC. Interesting. Mason's brought along another avid collector, William Zhang. What sort of artifacts do we see? Well, we a lot of pottery, a lot of jade. And according to... Like a master with his apprentice, Mason is passing on a lifetime of experience and expertise, including how to spot forgeries. At an excavation site turned museum, Mason introduces William to an old friend, archaeologist Guo Dashun. In the 1980s, Mason and Guo helped piece together the history of Hongsan, China's oldest civilization. Their study of jade artifacts, found alongside skeletal remains in these tombs, helped tell the story of a sophisticated culture. Those artifacts are now on display, the intricate jade carvings rich in symbols of Chinese folklore. When I was a little, right, we didn't know anything of uh, early, uh, history, nobody knew. But after their discovery, they changed the whole ancient history of China. So this is uh, tremendous. Collecting uh, antique, you know, make you uh, think more about history. But it was while piecing together the history of this site that Guo had his first run-in with fake jade artifacts. Soon after we first made this discovery in the 1980s, copies began showing up in public. We thought it was strange at the time. But then in the 90s, to our surprise, the number of forgeries exploded. Mason and Guo say for a period they got bogged down in sifting through real and fake artifacts, making historical conclusions based on a forgery can take years to correct. Fakes happen all the time. It happened yesterday, and it's happening today. 
and it's going to happen tomorrow again. In a way, it's a race between fakers and the authenticators. So just like a wildfire, we have to put it down all the time. So this is the antique market here. Ah, uh -huh. it's really something. We wanted to see for ourselves just how widespread the fake jade industry is. And so we head to a local antiques market. Filming with hidden cameras, it doesn't take us long to find vendors selling what they say is Hong San Jade. Some pieces are so good, even Mason can't tell the difference from the real thing. This could be. Could be. So well done. Almost like a bone of an animal on the back, right? I really don't know. But you know, this, this work impressed me. This work impresses you? Yeah. So whether it's a fake or not, we don't know. But we don't know. We decide to press the seller further. He sticks to a story. We move on to other vendors selling jade. At this one, they're honest about their items being copies. And in the shop next door, <laughs> a couple offers advice on how we can profit from a purchase. Throughout the market, we find a mix of both good and bad coffees. Mason says the problem is there are few scientific tests out there that can prove what's truly fake. That leaves experts relying on their own knowledge and senses. Yeah. I'm a bit confused now. Are you? Yeah. Really? Because you know, the shop, I mean, they keep on telling you that these are, these are new, whatever. You know, if they, if they are very truthful about it, you know, they tell you that these are new, and that means that they can fake anything. Mm. That means that there is no, there is no antique. Yes, everything is fake. So Mason, what did you think of what we saw inside here? Yeah. There seems to be so much uncertainty as to what is real or fake. Well, you, if you have enough experience, you, you can say yes, 100% this is genuine, ancient. But as a scholar, collector, expert may disagree. So there is a gray area. Of course. <laughs> But for local construction millionaire Wang Dongli, there is no gray area when it comes to buying up the past. Besides keeping exotic birds, Wang has gathered what he says is the world's largest collection of Hong San period artifacts. Like so many self-made millionaires, he likes nothing more than showing off. And what better status symbol than to have your own museum? Included are stones Wang says were used as musical instruments. There's also a cave depicting life in this Stone Age culture. So, Archaeologists have raised doubts about his interpretation of the past, along with whether his artifacts are real. 
这都是真的。So、He remains unfazed. 真的东西，它是会有会说话的。嗯，你明白他的，你和他会有对话的。啊，你认识他。Many of Wang's relics have been authenticated by experts. Still, he does admit to having been duped in the past. Can you say with 100% certainty that all your items here are real? I did collect some fakes early on, and I still have them stored away in a box. They remind me to always stay aware. But my collection on display now is 100% authentic. While initially angry at being ripped off, Wang says he's had a change of heart about those selling forgeries. At first, yes, I was angry. But then I realized that every person needs to survive. And one sometimes must do desperate things just to feed oneself. In southeastern China, there is one place where producing forgeries is more than just about survival. In Jingdezhen, it can make you a fortune. This city was once China's imperial center for ceramics. Emperors would order the finest pieces of art in the world from the craftsmen here. Today, 4,000 workshops are still operating. Most of the city, in fact, is employed in the ceramics business. And every day they spin out tens of thousands of replicas from bygone eras. But not all of it is legal. The sheer size of the ceramics industry here is incredible. It's estimated that beyond those doing legitimate artwork, there are thousands making forgeries. So how long have you been collecting for? Many years already. Collecting, uh, collecting becomes my habit, you know. Uh, we meet up again with Mason's friend, William Zhang. A former banker, Zhang's real love is Chinese ceramics, and he spent a fortune acquiring them. When I acquired a piece of antiques, or when I uh, wanted to acquire it, you know, I would spend a lot of time, considerable uh, amount of time, to understand um, those objects, on how it was made, you know, uh, what's the meaning of it, you know, the part of the history that it was made for, you know, the, uh, the functionality of it. William agreed to join us in Jingdezhen to help us hunt down the underground criminal operations cheating the auction world. We have to understand the objects before we know whether we are full or we're not. Every piece of um, the ceramics, once it's created, is an art piece is, you know, by, its own, by its own right. But whether I'm going to value the object itself as an art piece or I'm going to uh, value the object itself as a historical item. Sure, no one wants to be fooled. That's what I'm looking for as well. To get in with the master forgers here, we'll need William's expertise. And so together, we hit the road. Well, it's taken some weeks to set up, but we've convinced one man to show us what he says are high-level fakes. We're off to meet him now. We enter the narrow alleys of the city, passing several ceramics workshops. Where we're going requires us to use hidden cameras. Eventually, by a blue gated compound, we meet our contact. Hey, yeah. Yeah. We've told Zhang we're collectors interested in buying fakes. He turns out to be a government official working for the Culture and Relics Bureau. He shows us an excavation site. Next, Zhang takes us inside to look over some of the relics that have been dug up. What follows is hours of being toured around. He takes us to another government site. It's an ancient house 
where more real antiques are being stored. We sense Jung is feeling us out to see if we're the type of collector he can strike a deal with. Fortunately, William knows his stuff. And finally, in the van, Jung opens up. Let me see inside. Yep. Then he reveals more. Zhang takes us to meet the forgers who claim to have made the fake vase, which sold for hundreds of thousands. Inside, we find many pieces in different stages of production. The workshop is run by three brothers. They bring out a blue Qing Dynasty vase. It's a prototype, they say, of the one auctioned off. William is impressed by the quality. Here, here is amazing. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't be able to tell it's impossible. The brothers claim their client brought an original in to have it copied and then sold the fake. They show us a picture of the vase in an auction house's catalog. We later confirm a red vase of similar shape and size was sold in a recent U.S. auction. It was expected to sell for $50,000, but went for more than $480,000. The auction house didn't return our repeated calls for comment, but their website says the vase came from a Boston estate. The brothers tell us they regularly replace real items with fakes. Jiang feels they aren't fairly compensated for their skills. Over the next few days, we visit several workshops. Modern day forgers use all types of techniques. Hydrofluoric acid. And chemicals to make pieces look old, to fool the experts. In this room, full of Ming Dynasty knockoffs, we're told it takes years to create a high end forgery. Over tea, this man tells us how he sees his forgeries as honoring the art of ancient masters. As a result, he tries to make them as close to the original as possible, no matter how long it takes. While the forgers are eager to please, they're also beginning to realize the potential value of their work. Where once they simply took a fixed price, they're now demanding a larger cut. That's their final pitch. We leave, thanking them for their time. The scope and quality of the forgeries has rattled us.
They have a green bit of color. I think the moral of this visit is that I got to study harder, I got to see more, I got to learn better, um, I got to make sure that uh, uh, the source of uh, um, those objects uh, are genuine, are, are clear to me. Still shocking, right? Uh, it, it is. It is shocking. 121 million, L0002. Thank you both very much. Back in Hong Kong, the buyers are as keen as ever. L0002. The prized imperial painting sells to an undisclosed buyer for 15.6 million US dollars. Another record. Sotheby's says it takes extreme care to ensure forgeries don't make it into its auctions, and it's confident fakes can be identified. But they say in this complex market, clients must also educate themselves. Thank you, Peter.